Traveling from the city of Caen in northern France to the nearby town of Eversy, a traveler can hardly notice that the road is climbing up a small hill. Only at the top of the hill does the view open up to the entire valley between the rivers Orne and Odin. A few yards aside from the road, in the patchwork of fields, stands a small monument with an image of a wyvern and an inscription to the memory of all ranks of the 43rd Wessex Division who laid down their lives in the cause of freedom. For the soldiers who, 80 years ago, in July 1944, charged across this picturesque hill, it was known as Hill 112, the scene of one of the bloodiest battles in the Normandy campaign, a battle that brought victory to neither of the warring sides. Hill 112 emerged as a key strategic point in the weeks following D-Day. After the successful landing on the coast of Normandy, Allied troops encountered fierce German resistance inland. Days passed, but the Allies were unable to break through the German defenses and push out from Normandy. The situation was particularly challenging for the British and Canadian troops of the 21st Army Group, who became bogged down around the city of Caen. The first attempt by Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, the commander of the Army Group, to capture the city of Caen by encircling it from the west ended in defeat. However, Operation Perch succeeded in tying down German forces, preventing them from reinforcing other areas. Determined to keep the pressure on the Germans, Montgomery prepared a new offensive for late June, aiming to breach enemy lines again from the west, but this time closer to Caen. In this effort, Hill 112 became a main focus of attention. The strategic importance of Hill 112 stemmed from its elevation and location. Although only 100 meters high, the summit offered a clear view of the surrounding area, including the roads leading to the city of Caen. This made it a critical point to control for both the British and the Germans. For the British, holding the hill would enable them to push northwest towards Caen, a crucial objective for winning the Battle of Normandy. The hilltop provided an excellent vantage point for spotting and targeting German movements. Additionally, capturing Hill 112 was vital for securing roads and advancing further west along the Orne River and deeper into German-occupied France. The Germans also recognized the significance of Hill 112 and heavily fortified. The open terrain around the hill made it a perilous area for attacking forces as they could easily be targeted by defenders. The Germans were aware that losing the hill would give the British a significant advantage in the battle for Normandy. For these reasons, Montgomery decided to concentrate all his strength on this area by committing the entire 8th Corps to combat as part of Operation Epsom. Operation Epsom began with heavy artillery bombardments, followed by the first attack wave launched by the 15th Scottish Division on June 16, 1944. The fighting was intense as the Scots encountered well-prepared German defenses. The Germans had fortified the villages and surrounding areas with strong points, making it difficult for the British to advance quickly. The 11th Armored Division, tasked with exploiting any breakthroughs made by the infantry, also faced significant challenges in advancing due to fierce German resistance. On June 27, the British forces concentrated their efforts on reaching Hill 112, which was heavily defended by elements of the 12th SS Panzer Division. To capture the hill, the British deployed tanks from the 23rd Hussars, supported by infantry from the 8th Rifle Brigade. The advance proved difficult as the British tanks came under heavy fire from German anti-tank guns and well-entrenched positions. After going through some heavy fighting, the British forces managed to reach the northern slopes of Hill 112. However, with the southern slopes still under their control, the Germans launched counterattacks, deploying tanks and infantry in an effort to push the British off the hill. The fighting was intense, with both sides suffering heavy losses. A combination of these counterattacks and devastating fire from well camouflaged anti tank positions ultimately halted the British advance. Despite these challenges, the British were determined to hold their ground. They reinforced their positions on Hill 112 by bringing in more troops and tanks to secure the area. The fighting continued throughout the day as the Germans made several attempts to retake the hill, but the British held firm. By the end of the day, the British had established a firm foothold on Hill 112, but the battle was far from over. Over the next two days, the Germans launched a series of relentless counterattacks 
making it increasingly difficult for the British to maintain their positions. Realizing that holding Hill 112 would come at too great a cost in lives, the British decided on June 30th to withdraw to the banks of the Oden River, where they established a bridgehead. The story of Hill 112 was not over yet. In fact, they were about to enter a more deadly chapter. Even though Operation Epsom provided no tangible results, Montgomery was persistent to take Hill 112 and push the Germans across the River Orne. For this task, he planned to use the 43rd Wessex Division supported by Churchill tanks and the 4th Armored Brigade and the 31st Tank Brigade. The operation, codenamed Jupiter, was divided into four phases. First, the British forces comprising the units of the 129th Brigade would capture the area around Fontaine et Topefort, Chateau de Fontaine, Hill 112, and Baron. This was the most important phase as it aimed to secure Hill 112. Next, the forces of the 130th Brigade would move on to capture and clear the village of Etterville. In the third phase, troops of the same brigade would capture Malteau and secure the area up to the River Orne. Finally, in the fourth phase, the tanks would move forward to check if there were any remaining enemy forces in the villages west of the River Orne. The infantry of the 214th Brigade would follow quickly to secure these positions. Montgomery's broader strategy beyond Operation Jupiter was to keep the Germans focused on the eastern part of the Normandy front, thus making it easier for the Americans to advance on the western part and eventually break out of the Normandy beachhead. Montgomery was aware that the Germans had strong defenses around Hill 112, including tanks, artillery, and infantry. Indeed, the Germans had prepared well for the battle. Their order of battle included units of the 10th SS Panzer Division Frunsberg with two Panzer Grenadier regiments, the 21st and 22nd SS Panzer Grenadiers. The armored support was provided by the 5th Company of the 10th SS Panzer Regiment, equipped with Mark IV tanks and Stug 3s. However, the main armored strength was provided by the 12th SS Panzer Division. Hitler Jugend included the new arrived Tigers of the 102nd Schwer SS Panzer Battalion, which was around 28 operational Tigers. Montgomery also knew the Germans were determined to hold the hill with these formidable forces. However, he also believed that the British forces could overcome their defenses with careful planning and the support of tanks and artillery. To help with the attack, Montgomery also arranged for significant fire support. The Royal Air Force fighter bombers were assigned to attack key targets like Malteau, Eversy, and Eski. This air support was intended to weaken the German defenses and make it easier for the British forces to advance. HMS Rodney, armed with nine 16-inch guns, HMS Roberts, equipped with two 15-inch guns, and HMS Belfast, carrying 12 6-inch guns, all stationed in the Battle of the Seine, were to contribute with their devastating firepower. The entire operation was planned carefully. The British forces were to assemble at night to avoid detection by the Germans. The tanks moved into position under cover of darkness, and final briefings were given to ensure everyone knew their tasks. After being delayed several times due to various difficulties, the operation was set to begin on July 10, 1944. On the morning of July 10, 1944, at 4.45 a.m., British forces began their attack on Hill 112 with a 15-minute artillery bombardment. The goal was to surprise German defenders. The Churchills of the RTR moved forward in the darkness, hoping to catch the Germans off guard. However, the Germans, stationed on higher ground in the Odon Valley, had already noticed the British preparations the night before and were ready for the attack. Nevertheless, the Germans were hit hard by devastating British bombardment. Over 512 guns, including 25-pounders and medium artillery, were concentrated on the 3,500-yard front. The earth trembled under the relentless explosions of hundreds of shells. The shelling was so intense that Panzer Grenadiers recalled later how the British artillery was even worse than what they'd faced in Russia. The bombardment left many soldiers stunned and unable to move. Some were even driven mad by the constant drum fire, unable to endure the relentless bombardment. As the first shells flew through the air, the British attack started with four infantry battalions moving up the slopes of Hill 112, pushing through waist-high crops. On the left flank, the 4th Wiltshires moved forward, excited by the noise of their artillery. 
However, minutes later, they started to hear shells whistling towards them. Their own guns dropped short, causing massive casualties. Despite this tragic mistake, the order was given to keep going, and the troops headed into the hell of tank fire, mortar, and machine gun fire from the Germans. In the center, the 4th Somerset Light Infantry entered the open ground, making them easy targets. The German defenders opened fire with machine guns and mortars, forcing the British soldiers to dash from one shell hole to another for cover. The Churchills of the 7th Royal Tank Regiment supporting the infantry also came under attack by German soldiers armed with Panzerfausts. The German anti-tank guns hidden in the cornfields also took their toll on the British tanks. Several Churchills were destroyed mere minutes after they entered combat. The British infantry pressed on, but the German positions were strong. The soldiers had to clear each trench and bunker one by one. The fighting was close and brutal. British Churchill Crocodile flamethrower tanks of the 141st Regiment were attacking German positions by sending flames across the battlefield and directly into the German trenches. But even with this support, the British advance was slow. The German defenders were determined, fighting back with everything they had. The sun had barely risen, but the battlefield was already littered with the dead and wounded. Casualties among the British infantry were severe. The 4th Somerset, who had led the attack, suffered especially heavy losses. Their companies, which should have been 100 men strong, were reduced to 20 or 30. Some platoons only had 4 or 5 men left. The Germans also suffered greatly, especially from the relentless British artillery that had devastated their positions. The surviving German troops were left to hold their lines along the Colne Everesy road that had ran across the hill with reduced numbers, facing the ongoing British pressure. Luckily for them, the line behind the road was reinforced with four dug-in Panzer IV tanks, which proved to be an insurmountable obstacle for the Churchills of the 7th Royal Tank Regiment. Only thanks to the fire from the 17-pounder anti-tank guns hidden in the cornfields, did the British manage to eliminate this threat. However, by the time these tanks were destroyed, more Panzer IVs arrived at the hill to force the Churchills to retreat down the northern slopes of the hill. Throughout the day, British tanks remained in hull-down positions, which made them harder targets for the Germans. On the right flank, C Company of the 5th Wiltshire Regiment had advanced toward the western slopes of the hill but was pinned down by German forces, including dug-in panzers and machine gun firing from the nearby village of Eski. Due to the heavy fire, pinned down British soldiers were unable to advance further or retreat. In the midst of this dangerous situation, Company Sergeant Major Smith noticed a German tank advancing along the road towards his company. Despite the extreme danger, he acted quickly, grabbed a Piot, a handheld anti-tank projector, and ran through a cornfield toward the approaching tank. The Piot was a cumbersome weapon, known for its recoil and difficulty in aiming, especially in a situation where a quick, accurate shot was needed. Showing remarkable courage and composure, Smith fired the Piot from the hip, which was quite an unusual and risky way to use the weapon. Despite it, he hit the tank, knocking it out and stopping its advance. For this act of bravery, CSM Smith was awarded the Military Medal. However, the 5th Wiltshire was stuck in its forward position all day. They were eventually rescued with the help of the diversionary attack and artillery support, but with heavy casualties. Then came the Tigers of the 102nd Schwer Panzer Battalion. As the battle raged on the slopes of Hill 112, two Tiger platoons with seven tanks counterattacked the British troops, aiming to push them back away from the hill. The Tiger tank had a profound psychological impact on Allied troops during World War II, contributing to what became known as Tiger Phobia. By the time of the Normandy invasion in 1944, the Tiger tank, along with the German 88mm gun, had already achieved a near mythical status among Allied soldiers. This was partly due to the fact that the British anti tank weapons, like the 6 pounder and the Sherman tank 75mm gun, struggled to penetrate the Tiger's thick armor except at close range or when attacking from the side or rear. This created a sense of helplessness among Allied tank crews, who often felt outmatched by the Tiger's superior firepower and protection. However, an extenuating factor for the British troops was that at Hill 112, the Tigers advanced without the proper support of infantry, a tactic they used extensively on the Eastern Front. Isolated, 
Tigers were exposed to diverse fire, including six-pounders, M10 tank destroyers, and even Piats. The smoke screen provided by the artillery also helped separate Tigers from Panzer Grenadiers and contributed to the isolation and confusion of Tiger commanders on the battlefield. Despite the fear, the British threw everything they had at Tigers, including Churchill tanks, six-pounders, and M10 tank destroyers. A fierce firefight evolved that eventually led to the withdrawal of the German forces from Hill 112 with losses of tanks on both sides. The decisive factor in repelling the German counterattack was the devastating fire from the British troops. By late morning, the heaviest naval guns started shelling Hill 112. At around 1100 hours, the Tigers were forced to withdraw due to sustaining significant battle damage. Already by midday, the battle had cost both sides enormous casualties without achieving any of the goals. Other than a handful of observers and a few outposts, the plateau of Hill 112 had effectively become no man's land. While the men of the 129th Brigade were going through hell on the slopes of Hill 112, further to the northwest, troops of the 130th Brigade assaulted the villages of Etterville and Malto, both of great importance to securing Hill 112. The task of capturing the village of Etterville was assigned to the 4th Dorsets, who advanced through open fields toward the village early in the morning. The village was heavily defended by German SS Panzer Grenadiers, who had fortified the area with machine guns, mortars, and hidden positions. As the British soldiers moved forward, they were met with a barrage of mortar fire and machine gun bullets. However, the British managed to advance using Churchill tanks and flamethrowers to clear out the German positions. When they finally reached Etterville, the combat switched to house-to-house -house fighting in which the Germans put up equally strong resistance. Eventually, the British captured the village and took many prisoners. Still, the fighting was far from over. Immediately after losing the village, the Germans launched counterattacks, trying to push the British out of Vetterville. The British soldiers had to dig in and hold their positions, even as shells and bullets rained down on them. Meanwhile, in Malteau, the 7th Hampshire faced similar challenges. They advanced towards the village with the support of Churchill tanks. The Germans had also fortified Malteau, with SS Panzer Grenadiers and Tiger tanks waiting in ambush. As the British moved into the village, they were hit by heavy fire from German defenders. The fighting in Malteau was fierce, but the British managed to gain a foothold. As was the case in Etterville, the Germans responded with a severe counterattack that found the British soldiers surrounded and under constant fire. Their tanks were outgunned by the German Tigers, and many were destroyed. The British soldiers fought bravely, but with each minute, the situation was becoming increasingly desperate. In the end, the British were forced to withdraw from Malto. The battle left many dead and wounded on both sides. By late morning on July 10, 1944, it was clear to Major General Gerard C. O'Connor of the 7th Corps and Lieutenant General Ivor Thomas of the 43rd Wessex Infantry Division that the initial assault on Hill 112 had failed. However, despite the setback, orders were given to renew the offensive. Brigadier Michael Carver, in charge of the 4th Armored Brigade, was pressured to send his German tanks over the crest of the hill. Carver argued against it, knowing that the enemy still held strong positions, and advancing against them would likely result in heavy losses. As much as the British were determined to push with the offensive, the Germans were also resolved not to lose Hill 112. Panzer Group West issued orders to launch immediate counterattacks. The 19th SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment of the 9th SS Panzer Division, just relieved from another sector, was rushed back to the battlefield. They were instructed to retake Hill 112 and prevent the British from securing the high ground. In the afternoon, the Germans launched their counterattack on Hill 112. Tanks from the SS Panzer Corps, supported by intense artillery and mortar fire, moved against the British positions. The fighting was fierce, with shells and bombs exploding all around. The German tanks and Panzer Grenadiers faced heavy resistance as they tried to push the enemy off the hill. Once again, the British were saved by a powerful artillery barrage and Royal Air Force fighter bombers which attacked the German forces as they advanced. The Germans managed to reach some positions but were unable to fully secure the hill. Late in the afternoon on July 10th, faced with the devastating casualty toll, the British decided to bring in reinforcements from the 214th Brigade. 
the 5th Duke of Cornwall's light infantry, known as 5 DCLI, was ordered to attack Hill 112. Unit's commanding officer, Lt. Col. Dick James, had just taken control of 5 DCLI two weeks earlier. At the time of the battle, he was only 26 years old. The attack began at 8.30 p.m. just as the light was fading. Two companies led the charge, followed by tanks and more infantry. The plan was simple, bombard the enemy positions, then advance across the 500 yards of open ground to reach the orchards and woods on the hill. The enemy opened fire as soon as the British broke through the hedge that had provided them some cover. Tracer bullets were crisscrossing the field in front of them, with mortar shells exploding all over the place. The noise was deafening, and the air was filled with smoke and the smell of gunpowder. As soon as the British approached the orchard, the Germans started throwing stick grenades at them. The grenades were landing dangerously close, but the Brits were level-headed enough to grab them and throw them back at the Germans. A lucky circumstance was that stick grenades had longer time delay fuses, giving them enough time to toss them away. As they continued to push forward, men of the 50 CLI found themselves halfway to the orchard. They paused in a dip in the ground, taking a moment to catch their breath. The enemy fire was intense, but the soldiers knew they had to keep moving. The Germans, realizing they were being overwhelmed, began to retreat from their positions in the orchard. British soldiers were elated as they saw the enemy running away. It was the first time they felt a sense of victory in the battle. However, some soldiers caught up in the excitement chased the retreating Germans too far and got killed. The remaining soldiers dug in to defend their position, knowing that the Germans would counterattack. Indeed, the Germans launched several counterattacks that night. They sent in tanks and infantry to try and retake the hill. Despite the heavy fighting, the soldiers of 5 DCLI did everything they could to hold on to the orchard on Hill 112. They knew they were in a critical position, but fought bravely to keep it. Because of the much blood spilt to conquer it, British soldiers named the orchard Cornwall Wood. As the night wore on, the men of the 5th DCLI were under constant bombardment. The Germans launched repeated counterattacks. As more men were killed or wounded, their strength gradually declined. Stretcher bearers worked tirelessly to evacuate the wounded, but the dead were left where they fell. Major Roberts, one of the company commanders, said the situation was so dire it would have tested even the most seasoned of troops. In these moments, Lt. Col. James, leading the battalion, showed great courage and leadership. His calmness and action inspired his men to hold their ground. When the morning broke out and the Germans launched a massive counterattack, Lt. Col. James climbed a tree in the orchard to get a better view of the battlefield. From this vantage point, he could see a company of Germans forming up to attack. Using a telescope, he began issuing orders to direct artillery fire onto the enemy. The artillery fire was quick and accurate, landing on top of the Germans within seconds. Lt. Col. James's ingenuity and bravery were crucial in slowing down the German advance. At 7.20 a.m., Standarten Fuhrer Sylvester Stadler, commander of the 9th SS Panzer Division, reported to the 2nd SS Panzer Corps that he had taken Hill 112, but the British were still holding the northern half of the orchard. The Germans were dug in along the south rim of the plateau. The Cornwalls received a hot meal and tea during the lull in the fighting, but their situation remained dire. Taking the opportunity, Lt. Col. James climbed another tree to get a clearer view of the situation. As he was looking out, a burst of MG-42 machine gun fire hit him in the neck. The gunfire almost beheaded him, and he fell dead to the ground. His death caused panic and confusion to break out among British troops. Men were left without a clear leader, and fear quickly spread. During this chaos, someone gave the order to withdraw. It's unclear where this order came from, but it was not authorized by the chain of command. Some believe it might have even been a trick by the enemy. The soldiers began to pull back, retreating from their positions in the orchard. As they reached the lines of the 7th Somerset Light Infantry, officers at the rear quickly realized what was happening. One officer, even though seriously wounded, took out his pistol to rally the men. The soldiers were ordered to reform and return to their positions on the hill. Despite the fear, the troops obeyed the command. Led by Major Roberts, the men were reorganized into four small fire companies, each only the size of a platoon. They marched back up the hill, returning to the positions they just left. The quick action by the officers prevented what could have been a complete collapse. 
The exhausted soldiers' morale somewhat improved when they saw the Sherman tanks of the 4th Brigade Royal Scots Greys arriving on the battlefield as reinforcement. Unfortunately, the moments of joy didn't last long as the Shermans quickly came under fire from the German anti-tank guns and Tiger tanks, which destroyed five British tanks. The situation became critical, with the remaining tanks and infantry suffering heavy casualties. As the day progressed, the fighting remained brutal. The Cornwalls were reinforced by the first Worcesters and more tanks of the Scots Greys, but the enemy fire was relentless. The Shermans moved up to positions around the orchard, where they were visible to the enemy and quickly came under attack. The Tigers knocked out several Shermans to the horror of the Cornwalls, who watched as the tanks burned, unable to help the crews inside. By 3 p.m., the battalion was reduced to no more than 100 men, and the situation was becoming untenable. The remaining anti-tank guns were destroyed, and the only defense against the Panzers were a few Piots. After Major Roberts got wounded, the only remaining officer, Major Fry, took control of the battalion. After seeing four German Stug 3s advancing, raking the British positions with machine gun and shell fire, he realized they couldn't hold the orchard any longer. Fry sent a message back to Brigade Headquarters asking for permission to withdraw. The reply was to hold as long as possible, but Fry knew they had no choice. He spread the word to the remaining men. They would retreat under the cover of smoke. When the signal was given, everyone was to move out on their own, keeping well separated. As the smoke billowed across the plateau, Major Fry gave the order to retreat. The men grabbed their gear and ran, dodging shells and mortar fire as they fled. The retreat was chaotic, but it saved the lives of many soldiers. Of the 400 Cornwalls who fought in the orchard, fewer than 100 soldiers, many wounded, reached safety. The battalion had suffered 320 casualties, with 93 men buried on Hill 112. The Cornwalls dug in behind the 4th Somersets, facing an uncertain future, but determined to continue fighting. As darkness fell, the 4th Somerset Light Infantry was ordered to mount a surprise attack to capture the orchard. The attack was to be silent, with no preliminary bombardment. The companies advanced, but the rocky ground made digging in difficult, and they quickly came under enemy fire. The attack was unsuccessful, and the companies were forced to withdraw. The battle for Hill 112 was finally over. Soldiers on both sides could breathe a sigh of relief after one of the most devastating clashes in the Battle of Normandy. The scale of its ferocity is best portrayed by a devastating casualty toll on both sides. The Frunsberg Division reported that most of its Panzer Grenadier companies were reduced to the size of platoons. They needed a thousand replacements every 10 days, but only received 100 to 150 men. This shortage led to the disbanding of the 3rd Battalion of the 22nd SS Panzer Grenadiers due to a lack of manpower. The British also faced heavy losses. The 43rd Wessex Division suffered over 2,400 casualties. Although the British still had enough replacements in their holding units, the pool of replacements was running low, creating a looming manpower crisis for the 2nd Army. To address this, the upcoming Operation Goodwood was planned to be led by three British armor divisions, with infantry divisions taking a second role. Such a high casualty toll brought the competence of Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery under suspicion. The British exhausted their forces in trying to break the German defense of South Conn and achieved nothing. However, even though Montgomery failed to make a significant territorial gain, the strategic importance of his operations was very important for the outcome of the Battle of Normandy. As German commanders had repeatedly warned Berlin, their panzer divisions were being burnt out. The battle for Hill 112 had not been in vain. Thank you for watching this episode. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. Stay tuned.